Uh, so thank you, Joe, for that introduction and for inviting me. And thank you to all of you for uh, sticking around to, to hear about what we're, uh, what we're working on. To set the stage of what I'm going to talk about, uh, let's start with comparatively recent, not going all the way back to that first announcement that Joe mentioned, August 17th of this year, two LIGO observatories in the US and, and Virgo, were they were all on. And this is what they were seeing. So what you're seeing here is uh, sliding by in, in real time of, of that m uh, morning. On the vertical axis for each of these uh, observatories, you're seeing basically frequency. I don't have the audio on this particular clip. We'll get to that later. But you start to see, especially in that middle track there along the bottom, something that looks like a line that's a little brighter, and it's about to get much brighter still. You also see it uh, up above in Hanford. You don't really see anything down below in the, the thing that comes to Virgo. So you're seeing frequency plotted versus time there. If you're a gravitational wave data analyst, that was extremely exciting. If that didn't seem exciting to you, well, here's an animation of what we think was actually happening, or more precisely, what had happened several million years earlier uh, to cause what we saw there. So this, this is a not quite artist representation of two neutron stars spiraling around each other in the last few seconds. And we actually did observe seconds before they merge. And then that's what we call a kilonova there, that expanding cloud of gas. And then shooting off that jet that you see sort of blooming there as it meets the interstellar medium um, is what caused a gamma ray burst. So this, uh, this is an animation courtesy of NASA and specifically uh, NASA Goddard. That animation, if you can remember that as we talk about it, is the first observation just this year of the collision of two neutron stars. It had been uh, theorized as an explanation for what are called short gamma ray bursts. I'll come back to that. We're going to open and end with this most recent discovery. So what am I wanting to talk to you about today? I want to review some of the recent science from both gravitational wave astrophysics by itself and the emerging field that we call multi-messenger astronomy, where we combine both gravitational waves together with other more traditional instrumentation. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the detectors work and the data they generate, because that will at least inform an understanding of what are some of the computational challenges that we face. My work is, is as a data analyst and optimization for LIGO laboratory. So uh, let's go back to that first announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So it was short and to the point, and it was exciting for us. That's uh, February 11th, 2016 at the National Press Club, and that's uh, Dr. David Reitze, who's the executive director of the LIGO Laboratory. You see up on stage there also uh, Dr. Franz Cordova is the director of the National Science Foundation there on the left, Gabriela Gonzalez at the time, the uh, spokesperson of the collaboration, and then those two gentlemen to the right, uh, Ray Weiss and Kip Thorne, just about a month and a half ago were awarded uh, co-shares of the Nobel Prize in Physics for that announcement because they were the, the founders and originators of the project along with Barry Barish. So that was then on the front page of many newspapers. For, for us as a scientist, uh, there's, there's very little that compares with that excitement. We were actually reporting on a detection that was made. Uh, this, this number you see here, 1509, GW 1509.14. I've had uh, occasionally a student say, well, you know, it's just a number. It, it's, it's actually 15, 2015, September 14th. So it's the date that we first received that signal, but it took several months to analyze it, be confident, double check everything. That was a groundbreaking event in science, probably still, even after our BNS announcement, um, and I will try to avoid the acronyms, Binary Neutron Star, BNS, um, one of the most exciting uh, and received as exciting events. What happened then? What was the science that happened there? Well, it's the direct observation of gravitational waves. If you read newspapers, if you saw news accounts, they probably emphasized that. They probably even said, proving Einstein right 100 years later, uh, and that is all true. I say direct because there was already indirect evidence for gravitational waves. In fact, a Nobel Prize in physics had already been awarded for that indirect evidence to Hulse and Taylor in the 90s. 
But this is the first time that we actually didn't just see two things getting closer together in a manner consistent with their losing energy from gravitational waves, but we detected the waves themselves. So that's exciting, that's interesting, but it's a lot of resources to spend if all we were doing was checking something we were pretty sure already. So one of the things that I hope to convey to you in this talk is all of the exciting things we do after and in addition to making that first observation. This was the first observation of what we call a binary black hole system, that is two black holes orbiting each other. We've had lots of evidence before for the existence of black holes and it's always indirect, something else going around them. Black holes, as the name suggests, black, they don't give off any light. So if the only thing that you can see is some kind of light, and like many astronomers, I'll use light to mean anything that's photons, whether it's radio waves, x-rays, gamma rays, optical light, infrared, something going around that black hole, be it other stars as we can see at the center of our own galaxy, disks of hot accreting gas, that was the evidence there had to be something else there that gave off light. We didn't see two of them isolated by themselves because you're looking for two black dots going around each other in the night sky. And that's very hard to resolve convincingly. These two, some facts about them, they're uh, 410 megaparsecs, which is um, about a billion light years away, which means that what we're talking about happened that long ago. They had masses of about 29 and 36 times the mass of our sun. We actually didn't really know about black holes in that particular mass range. They were either less massive than that or much, much more massive than that. So that was interesting as an astronomer to observe that. Some of the impressive facts about this. Those two initial black holes, 2936, adds up to give you 65. The final black hole had a mass of 62 solar masses. So three solar masses went missing. Where did it all go? It was converted into energy carried away by the gravitational waves. So sometimes people refer to gravitational waves as being very weak. It's really more correct to say they interact very weakly with other matter. But they have a huge amount of energy. We're not saying this is three times as bright as the sun. The sun over its whole 10 billion year life cycle will convert a tiny fraction of a percent of its mass into energy. This is taking three times the mass of the sun, converting it into pure energy in a fraction of a second. If that had been invisible light, rather than gravitational waves, it would have been brighter by about a factor of 20 than the rest of the observable universe combined. It would have been brighter than the full moon and you could have read by it at night for a quarter of a second while it happened. So that's the scale of the energy involved in these systems and what we're talking about. But you should also be maybe thinking, well, how do you know? How do you get from a graph like what I showed there at the very beginning, something in frequency and time, to knowing that? So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the detector. I am not an instrumentalist. They would never dream of letting me touch the mirrors. But the basic technique of how LIGO operates and Virgo and the other interferometric gravitational detect detectors, we send laser light to a beam splitter and half of it keeps going straight and half of it goes perpendicular and it hits test masses that are hanging by a very sophisticated suspension system and they bounce back, hit that beam splitter again and come out perpendicular to where they went in. And that's where there's a photodiode recording this interference. If you're a physics student, you will probably at some point read about Michelson interferometer. I mean, I spent a spring break squinting over one as an undergraduate trying to get it to work right. Um, and we're looking as that light cancels out. Why does that matter? Well, the Einstein's theory of gravity predicts that gravity is a curvature of space-time, so something that's moving, changing gravitational waves is stretching and contracting space so that one of those arms gets longer while the perpendicular one gets shorter, and then that changes, and it goes back and forth like that. So that's what you saw animated there, that going back and forth and that stretching and contracting and the rate at which it happens is that signal you saw represented uh, on that first slide. But it's not quite as simple as that might lead you to believe. These are pictures of the two LIGO detectors. In the top left, you see the one in Livingston, Louisiana, about uh, not half an hour, say, from Baton Rouge. Then um, the second one is in Hanford, Washington. Uh, very different. Uh, it's, it's always easy to tell from an aerial shot which is which. Um, those arms that you saw in the previous movie are four kilometers long. That's the length that you're seeing stretch and contract is something between those two test masses that are four kilometers long with a very sophisticated suspension system for those hanging mirrors. That includes multiple stages, active feedback to control for, for vibrations. But still, with all that, you're looking for a very small effect. And here's one animation of just how small. This is a, supposed to be a hydrogen atom. And we're zooming in on the single proton that is the nucleus of that atom. 
And now we're going to see over the course of that four kilometers how much those mirrors moved relative to each other. Uh, so another way of putting it, as it's also been explained in some settings, it's measuring the distance from the Earth to the second closest star, uh, Proxima Centauri, which is about four light years away. Not the nearest, that's the sun. Four light years away, trillions of miles, measuring that distance to within an accuracy that's less than the width of a human hair. That's the level of precision of measurement that we're trying to make. So it's difficult. <laughs> and again, as I said, they don't let me do that, but what I like to say when I'm discussing this is that if our instrument is that sophisticated, our data analysis and what we do with the, out, with the product of that has to be equally uh, uh, sensitive and equally sophisticated. So, I'm not talking too many details about our computation, but I do want to give you some feel for where do we use computation. Certainly there's some in the design and operation of that instrument that I just mentioned, but mostly it happens afterwards. Those, that one photodiode seeing that cancellation or non-cancellation of those light waves with some fairly sophisticated calibration looking at all the feedback gives you basically a time series of data. So we're getting these time series of data from however many interferometers are working. Initially in the, in the first observing run and the first part of the second observing run that just ended, that was the two LIGO interferometers with the four kilometer long arms. The end of the second observing run, we also had Virgo, which is in Italy. It's actually a separate experiment, but we, we collaborate. Uh, that three kilometer long arms, you get these three time series of data. So what do we do with that data? It's, it comes to us as a data analyst in 16 kilohertz frames that we find on disk. Uh, so there's also a low latency that does a similar thing. Well, the first thing is what we call searches. Those look at all of the data to see if there's something interesting there. There are both model searches which say, well, if I'm looking for these two things going around each other and I have a theory, general relativity, that predicts what should be happening, then I can look for that signal even if it's very, very weak. We've actually been fortunate that our, some of our first few discussions have been so loud. You can see it by eye in the data. We never expected to see that in a Q-scan like that in the data. We expected to have to dig it out with match filtering. Also, unmodeled searches that can see some of the very loud things also useful in case we're seeing something that we don't have a good model for, like a supernova, something very violent. There are also simulations of those systems. So that first thing, as I'll explain in a little more detail, it's um, in intrinsically parallel. So it's, we use a lot of computing resources, but we don't, by and large, have to have uh, multiple nodes on a cluster talking to each other with MPI or some other technology. All of those nodes can just, all of those jobs can run in parallel looking at different parts of the data, comparing it to different uh, perspective templates. The simulations, like the, the first one I showed you is really more an animation, but what was playing as uh, Joe walked up here really is a simulation. Those are solving a system of partial differential equations. If they've got neutron stars, there's hydrodynamics involved, and that takes months of time on a, on a computer cluster. It feeds into those searches, because although we can't afford to run one of those for every single uh, sample system we might want to look at, we still are going to use that to calibrate the particular uh, templates that we'll use. Then also parameter estimation, which is kind of like a, doesn't look at the whole data, but looks very, very closely at the things that we identify. That uses some slightly different techniques. It still is, in essence, comparing a prediction to the data, but we're trying to now really nail down how, when I say the masses were this and that, that comes from something like parameter estimation. So that's using techniques like um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and, and various specific variants of that. And so all of these are techniques that probably many of you are going to be experts in or have used in your own work, but that's kind of where they show up in the broad field of LIGO computation. So this is showing you an animation of how, just to give you some flavor of why we have to do match filtering. So as we change that relative angle from face on to edge on of the binary system, two things going around each other, that thing on the right there, on your right, is uh, showing, imagine any two of those dots at 90 degrees being those test masses at the end. So exactly what that pattern is depends on many things, for instance, and here's one example, how inclined that particular plane is. So by looking at that signal, we learn something about what's the angle at which that system uh, is tilted towards us. Well, it also gives a different signal if the masses are different. It can give a different signal uh, if the spins of the objects themselves are different. All those things affect what's happening in that, in that system. 
And so that's what we're doing, whether we're talking about the match filtering to find such things, we need to be able to account for all these differences because a priori, we don't know what, what's out there and we don't want to miss something because we made too conservative of an assumption. <clears throat> so here is, I've, I've purposefully tried to avoid really any equations in this talk, but this is an animation of, of the basic match filtering that we're doing. So for one particular template, which might correspond to one, choices, one choice of saying, well, we're looking for two black holes, they have these two masses and these two spins relative to each other, then we get a prediction of what that looks like right up until they merge. But we don't have any idea when that might happen. So one of those variables that we have to search over is where does that signal happen in time? And so this is animating what that is. So they've taken some noise, that's what's on top in red, and you see how much weaker the actual signal is than the noise that's there. And, and in sort of the, the purple color is the signal, in this case it's a software injection, we artificially add that, so it's there. And as we slide it along and we just add up the, the inner product, if you wanted to, between e each point in that time series of the data what, plus the injection and the template, then you see at the bottom you get something that still basically looks like noise until you get to that one tall spike right when it lines up perfectly. So that's the thing that in our, our offline searches that we're really looking for. Uh, we're also gonna repeat this now. So this is actually a template that we don't really look for because this is a, a processing template where the things are wobbling a bit as the sort of envelope there would indicate. So I, one thing I could be doing is sliding this along and if I, at each possible value of the slide, I then do this inner product, well, if it's in samples long, we're usually looking at something about a million, two to the 20th, and I repeat, slide that and repeat it, that would be in squared, that would be the naive way, the wrong way of doing that. But we do have to do a search over that possible parameter space and we have to repeat that for every stretch of data and we have to repeat that for entirely different choices of mass and spin. It turns out that the right way to do this sort of search, to get that output down below but not to generate it in this bit by bit fashion because you're looking at things serially for all possible time slides, there's some math, the convolution theorem that tells you, uh, you want to do a uh, fo fast Fourier, tra you want to do a Fourier transform, which in a discrete setting is a fast Fourier transform. So we're going to do FFTs over and over and over. So when Dan is up here talking next, one of the things you should take in line is that for instance, as uh, interesting as this all is, at some point finding it comes down to doing a whole lot of FFTs over and over and over. So it matters very much how efficiently you do that. We designed the pipeline for that to be the dominant computational cost. For instance, for us that is actually one place where we're using MKL uh, so far in most of, our, uh, most of the platforms that we run on. That's the basic idea of match filtering. Now our most recent event, again. Okay, now that first um, chirp, the whoop, that is if you just cleaned up the data, converted to speakers, these things do tip happen at audio uh, frequencies typically. So it's not that you have sound traveling through space, but if you, after the gravitational wave stretch things, you, you put it to an, an ADC, they, we start our searches depending a bit on exactly which template in anywhere in the 20 to 30 hertz range that can go up to um, hundreds to around 1,000 hertz depending on exactly what kind of system we're talking about. That chirp is characteristic. Uh, I was talking earlier before, um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, we did have simulations. We could make these sounds before. We certainly didn't have data that demonstrated this until 2015. And so there were lots of talks that consisted of people doing what I basically just did, the whoop. Um, and that, that's rising in frequency and getting louder. So if you think back to that beginning animation, the closer things get to each other, the faster they're going around, so that makes the frequency go up, but also the closer they get, the stronger the fields that are near each other and are therefore radiating waves, so the louder the system gets. So that chirp is characteristic of an end spiral, but then stops when they merge and form whatever happens after they merge. That second thing on the top though, the gamma rays, so uh, for many, Many years we have observed what are called gamma ray bursts. There are a few different phenomena believed to be behind them. The leading contender for what are called short gamma ray bursts was that they were these mergers of a, of a binary system where at least one component was a neutron star. Two black holes colliding with each other don't really produce anything in the visible light spectrum. But these systems produce 
these intense gamma rays that seem to point in one very particular direction. So if you think back to that animation again, we saw that jet rising much faster than that cloud was expanding. Uh, that jet, as it hits the expanding cloud and as it hits the interstellar medium, will be creating the gamma rays and then later X-rays that we observe. So those have been observed for many decades. They're actually first observed by sa military satellites, which were in orbit to test compliance with test ban treaties. And they started seeing gamma rays that turned out not to come from uh, the Earth, but rather the distant, the distant universe. Uh, and you have to do those kinds of experiments in space because they, they don't penetrate the ionosphere and the atmosphere of the Earth. But we see that we had this event, and not quite two seconds later, this gamma ray burst detected, in this case, by the Fermi satellite, and also, which is NASA operated, also by the ESA operates the integral satellite. What we get to learn more when we have events like this that combine gravitational waves with light. But first we have to find it. So Fermi gives you a sky map that may look small to you. It's gigantic for someone who operates an optical telescope that's looking for a way to follow that up. The time delay between the two different satellites gives you that overlap region there, Fermi and integral. And then if we just look at the two LIGO detectors, they're also, we're really looking at a time delay, but that gives us that green, the, the long stretch green spot. Now, if you remember to that very first movie, we didn't really see anything in Virgo. That actually turned out to be very important because it was loud enough that we should have, except this event happened to occur in one of the points on the sky that's basically a blind spot to Virgo. All the interferometers have these, so we could find that long region from the two LIGO detectors and then zoom in on that more to see to, to, by knowing where it's blind in Virgo. So that really helped us with the localization, which happened a few hours after this event. We could send an alert to astronomers, who then, if you saw all those little dots and you saw how much you zoomed in, they all had to try and point their telescopes at those and see if there was this optical counterpart that was predicted. Uh, now, it, it may look like you've got not too many things to see there. A few things make that difficult. You, you have to check closely that, and also, this system, this time of year, was fairly near the sun, so you have to wait until the sun sets, and this is NGC 4993, and then go and look before the thing you're looking at sets. So you have this window, so during those intervening hours, the astronomy teams were trying to prioritize what order to look based on what do I see after the sunset and before it sets first. And so uh, the first report of the counterpart was by the Swope uh, telescope. This is two images from that telescope. The one on the left uh, represents the first photons that humanity has received in coincidence or from an event that uh, optical photons, I should say, the gamma rays are also photons that come from a, ga a gravitational wave event. So this is the mini telescope. It was found there are about 70 different optical telescopes that looked at this event uh, across a variety of wavelengths. When we made the press announcement in October, the source was still getting brighter in the radio frequency band. But if you see here, it starts off bright, the red arrow is pointing you to it, and blue, four days later, it is dimmer and redder. Now, what we believe that that's showing us is this thing called a kilonova, which is that expanding cloud of glass. This is by f gas, rather, not glass. It's really radioactive uh, elements. That, those two neutron stars, as they're torn apart, are what we now think are responsible for a lot of the formation of every element heavier than iron. In fact, that, that red glow is characteristic of that because you have something that's very opaque because those particular elements uh, overlay each other with so many different possible spectral lines because of the, the electron shells there. And it's expanding rapidly and cooling, which is what leads to this change from blue to red as it gets dimmer. So this has been hypothesized, and there had been one kilonova believed to be observed in 2013, but not in coincidence with a, a gamma ray burst. This is the closest short gamma ray burst ever observed by far, yet also fairly dim, would not have been followed up routinely except for the gravitational wave coincidence. Well, that's also telling us something. This is happening because it's not pointing directly at us. Most of the ones we see that are so bright and are so far away, we're looking down the beam of that jet, which also tends to obscure this cloud beneath it, which is not as bright. Because of the localization with LIGO, we could see this and confirm this hypothesis. 
So what else can we do with that? Well, as I said, the convincing evidence that short gamma ray bursts are from a binary merger with a neutron star. We've seen this kilonova. You, if you saw headlines about this recent announcement, they probably emphasized producing gold and platinum. We don't actually have spectral line resolution of those particular elements, but they are the lanthanide series that are, are believed to be in this cloud. But there's some possibility that most of the gold and platinum on Earth came from an event or several events such as this. The other thing um, that I would mention, and, and harken back to why the, co the cooperation between gravitational wave astronomy and uh, optical astronomy is important, is that we're starting to constrain exactly how stiff is a neutron star. That movie at the beginning where they're spinning around before they merge, you may have noticed they kind of stretched out a bit as they get closer and closer pointing towards each other. How much do they do that? Well, that's very hard to tell if all you see is the violent explosion afterwards. That looks more exciting, more like a science fiction movie, but it's a big explosion. So it's hard to know what happened unless you can see what happened before. And that's what the gravitational waves allow you to do. Exactly what that track through that very first graph looks like depends in part on what are the masses of those things and how much are they stretching as they get closer and closer to each other. We have constraints on that from this first observation, but we're especially looking forward to more and more observations. Another example, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but this gives us another way to measure the Hubble constant. Different methods are giving competing answers. Part, all of them rely in part on, it's tricky to know the distance to something very far away because you have to keep using a different method the further and further away you get. But gravitational wave signals let you get that distance directly without using what's called the cosmic distance ladder. That's some of the science that we're doing with gravitational waves and in conjunction with other optical astronomy. That was fantastic. This won't be nearly as fantastic because he has all the cool movies um, related to uh, astronomy, but it's really an incredible achievement what they've been able to do. But there is a big piece of that that has to do with software um, and the platforms that we run them on. And so I just wanted to take the last few minutes of the day uh, and say a few things about that. So first of all, let me say that uh, the team at LIGO and Advanced LIGO um, they used our center, but they also used a lot of other places, right? I'd love to say we're responsible um, for all of the stuff that happened, but um, we just did a small piece of the actual computation, and in the scale of computation, they do a small piece is like 7 million hours um, of compute time that went into that um, from the platform's attack, but how much hardware we threw at it um, is really just part of the story. Um, this is developers conference, I think, the bigger part is not only about software and software improvements, but sort of the culture around software and software improvement that's required um, to do these kinds of things. Uh, and of course, we're doing lots of additional things now that these detections have been made. We have multi-messenger and the simulation part um, that was talked about. So, um, you know, the LIGO stuff, as Josh just explained, was really a remarkable undertaking. Um, the error margin is ridiculous, right? The human hair, two stars. We got to fit this in 64 bits of floating point um, reputation, uh, representation. So round off error is kind of a big deal um, for these guys. Uh, but for me, not only is there the amazing part of it, but I think this was a great example of how we'd like collaborations between large science projects and computational people who worry about architecture and tools and software to really work. So a uh, little bit of history here. So. Um, I am pleased to say uh, that we didn't actually wait for them to win a Nobel Prize to start helping out here. Um, I was sort of digging back. The first paper I could find or just sort of press release we did about working with them was 2014, and we said we did a lot of great things with the software. Maybe something cool will happen perhaps one day. So, um, so glad we started it early. But what it really started out being about was um, LIGO and TAC and the Exceed network that we're part of. Um, are all NSF funded um, activities and the LIGO folks went to NSF and said, hey, thanks for the billion plus dollars to build big instruments. Um, we need a lot of money to do computing. We'd like to buy some big computers. And, um, someone in NSF said, well, we pay a lot of money for some other people to build computers, use those. Um, so it was, could we really take these big shared supercomputers and run these very specialized problems with this very sensitive um, software environment? So really the first th thing that we did together um, is sounds simple, um, but most of you work in HPC one way or another. Um, I think it's fair to say, looking back over 40 or 50 years of high performance computing, um, that perhaps we're not the most flexible people when it comes to changing the software stack um, on the machine or the kernel version or anything else. 
Um, I would also point out that in this particular collaboration, um, when they're worried about this sort of precision, they are perhaps also not the most flexible people to change the software stack um, when it comes out. So uh, we had to figure out, could we actually do this, right? Use a shared system um, uh, to get something done. So we started out with just proof of concept, and we ended up with, I think, some fairly significant results in performance improvement as well. So uh, the initial workflow, um, a lot of it was happening with Open Science Grid um, and some dedicated resources, but they were using a lot of pieces, a lot of tools um, that came from NSF-funded things, workflow managers, the Open Science Grid pieces, uh, Condor was in there, um, and an older version of Scientific Linux where they had fixed the libraries um, because from generation to generation, the goal was to get bit-for-bit -bit reproducibility in the result. Um, and, you know, if I were them, I would also be very, very cautious in letting results change um, given the margins that they're trying to search for. Um, there was also a lot of moving that data in and out, right? So the initial data processing, the FFT part, um, was sort of grid-based and is really a high throughput thing. So there's a huge amount of data flowing in and out of external networks um, to hit sites, different sites with computational resources. And no one site was going to have the hours to do this um, on its own. So the first thing that was the sort of relatively simple thing, but just really just involved the resolve by everybody that we're going to collaborate, we're going to actually make this happen, and we're just going to do what it takes um, to get it done. So we did some things with, you know, fun with modules and fun with Chirrut um, to build a custom environment for this where we could show, okay, first of all, we can use a new computer, we can use a shared computer in the Exceed network, and if you like, we can do a bit-for-bit -bit reproduction of everything that you have. So here's your workflow, here's it's still working, um, you know, sort of not the normal changes we make, but uh, we're committed to getting this done, so here's your bit-for-bit. And then the first thing you notice is there's a whole bunch of data coming in and out the way that these sort of high throughput systems work. So we have a lot of shared scratch. We just cache an enormous amount of the data, sort of spoof the way Condor and the open science grid things work so that the data was local. Um, <laughs> and uh, you don't have to go out and grab stuff as much. And so we got some speed up. So, um, so we've done a few collaborations. We've made a few changes together. Um, we're all sort of starting to trust each other over these first couple of years. But we still have the problem that tens of millions of hours were required. I think the sort of NSF analysis on this was something like $15 million a year of computation um, just to do that first stage, <laughs> the three phases that Josh mentioned, um, the high throughput computing around the FFT, a quote from Stuart at LIGO, um, that, hey, now that we can do this, maybe we really can use Exceed resources. We don't have to build dedicated infrastructure for this. Um, so as we started to get better at this, and here's where some of the Intel platforms start to play a role, um, I'm sure it comes as a shock to all of you who are developers that if you fix your libraries, your kernel, and your OS version in time, um, over a decade or two, um, those perhaps are not the most optimized things um, after five or six generations. So, um, but which led to just a whole series of conversations about what is the definition of correct um, when we're moving forward in scientific software, right? Is it bit for bit reproducibility? That means you fix the order of the floating point operations, right? Even reordering them, they'll round off differently, so you'll get a different answer, at least in terms of bits, right? So what is the actual error margin? How can we check that? Um, how can we get to where we're comfortable <laughs> that this is still not the same set of bits, but the same actual answer um, in the sensitive problem? And commendably, you know, there was a lot of hey, we need to make absolutely sure we're not hearing noise in these very um, fine detections, but let's talk about a good way to do this. So we had great conversations about that. Um, so we started measuring their efficiency on our Stampede system at TAC at the time. This was a 2012-2013 um, deployment, so we're talking about Sandy Bridge Xeons, and it had Knight's Corner cards in it. Um, so first, let's stick with Xeon. Uh, let's use MKL, which is now the standard thing they use. Let's start swapping out the FFTs, look at the lengths, put in the right optimizations, and make things happen. Um, and we tripled the performance. Um, you know, once we'd agreed to what the parameters were and that we'd try changing out this FFT, that ended up just being a few weeks of work um, to do. And 3x, and so 3x on $15 million a year of computation. So that was a pretty significant 
um, boost, and it meant that suddenly these things would fit in, in the machines that we had uh, throughout the NSF space and exceed to do. We went back a little later and said, hey, now that we're doing threaded parallel FFTs, we have a lot of cores on the Xeon Phi, and that got 5x um, versus the baseline. Uh, and so I believe in 2015, these results got published that showed Xeon, Xeon Phi, we can get answers that by many checks of errors are the same answer, even though the bits aren't the same as it was uh, years before, um, but good things are happening here. So a um, lot of optimization, a lot of performance improvement, uh, and a lot of money saved. So soon thereafter, you know, that 2015 publication, they got that first detection. Um, and while I'd love to say that had to do with all the software changes we made, it's totally a coincidence. Um, it had nothing to do with the software changes we made except that you could run the computation faster. Maybe the verification, we knocked a month or two off, Josh, I'm not sure. But, um, but I think for us on the collaboration side, so we trust each other, you know, they believe we have good ideas about how you might change code and get better performance. We're starting to really understand what the sensitivities are. Uh, and what we need to get to get right. Um, and so we invited Peter from LIGO to come back and talk a couple of years later about sort of how Stampede had played a role when we were announcing the second machine. Uh, so, and he said, you know, we thought we were pretty good at this. Um, you know, we'd spend a lot of time verifying our results and we still think we're pretty good at this, but we've learned a lot about there's more to do to make get performance out of software. This has been talked about all day here on the earlier panels. Um, there's a big difference between right and right and performance. <laughs> and so they felt like not just in this piece with the FFTs, but in all of the software things they were doing, they were sort of changing the culture around uh, optimization and that spending some time thinking about performance optimization on these codes is an important thing to do. Um, and to me, that was super exciting. Um, maybe not as exciting as discovering uh, the black holes colliding, and it's also perhaps a measure of what passes for excitement in my life, but, um, but the fact that not only did we just give them a big computer, but we changed their culture about how they approach it, right? Because if we're ever gonna make real strides in software, um, we have to change the culture about how people build particularly scientific applications, at least in my side of the world. Um, but this wasn't really the end of the line, this was sort of the beginning of a whole line of other things that could happen now that this stuff was there. So, um, we're starting to see sort of these second order effects, right? Uh, Josh talked about multi-messenger astronomy. He talked about sort of coupling this to simulation. Uh, um, it turns out we've started to do a lot of visualization. There's all these other steps and other ways people can use this data. Um, so one of the things that happens is after that first detection, um, the uh, uh, team at Cambridge, um, Stephen Hawking and company, um, said, hey, We've been writing these simulation codes for a very, very long time. Experimental results have been tough to come by, right? They were actually the patterns for these templates um, that they used to do the, the template matching. Uh, but at the same time, they went back to the code and say, now that we've done this detection, what does our code say the gravitational wave should look like if you had a 29 solar mass black hole and a 36 solar mass black hole, and you swirled them around and had them collide? Um, so and what, it, what is this? swirl actually looked like. So we started not only running these big simulations with a code called GR Chombo, um, uh, but we started doing some visualization along with it that is being shown off here, actually. So, and of course, being an advanced computing center, this is the chance to mention that we built another big computer and threw that at it as well, um, also involving some Intel technologies. So this is Stampede 2, um, actually just part of it. It's a big machine, so you know, you need to cult a couple of pictures, but that's sort of one end, and then you come down to the other end. Um, but this is the renewal system for Stampede. Uh, it's a mix of the second generation of Xeon Phi, Knight's Landing for 4,200 nodes, and then there's about 1,800 of the new Xeon nodes, Skylake, um, that actually just went into production a few days ago. Um, the Knight's Landings went up in June. Um, these uh, Skylakes have been added over the last few months. Um, so uh, about 18 petaflops of total computation. Um, and one of the very first things we did with it, I said we put the FIs into general production in June, but in May, um, we had a workshop with the Cambridge team. Some of the postdocs came over. Um, and actually, it was a broader workshop. It was part of the Xeon Phi users group. 
um, to look at what we call in situ visualization, which is um, the notion of these simulations are huge. We're starting to generate you know, potentially petabytes of data from not just these simulations, but a number of things. Let's just never write it to disk. Right? <laughs> Let's do the visualization while it's all still in RAM. Um, and write the frames out rather than write it all out to a file system and then read it all back in after the run, which may be weeks or months long, um, after many checkpoints and starting up again and visualize it later. Let's just do the viz while we're running it. Um, that first image I showed a couple slides back was one of the first results so that we can actually just see if the computation is doing anything right and then later to do the results without having to reread or store many petabytes of time steps. Um, I think this sort of second visualization we produced that actually from that workshop is a frame from the movie that was showing uh, as Joe got up here, um, or at least a similar one. Uh, but this was the start of this work of Ken G. Archambo produced those same waves as detected by LIGO from colliding these two black holes. Um, we've actually used a software stack that uh, some folks at TAC have been working with folks at Intel on in a very long time. Uh, it's called Software Defined Visualization, where we just partition some of the cores on, in this case, the night's landings. Um, so most of the cores are running simulation, and you can just pick a sliding bar on the hardware of how much you want to throw towards the ray tracing um, that we do with it as well. And so um, I was told to plug this, but if you go down to the Colorado room, apparently the same ray tracing is running um, right now. They were showing it off today. I think they're doing another version of this workshop which doesn't, wasn't just the cosmology folks. I think we had about 10 different teams from 10 different fields there working on applying this visualization to their software, but they're gonna repeat that workshop here tomorrow in one of the rooms or one of the sessions. Um, but uh, uh, if you go in there and see the both, I think they're using both landing and Skylake now, um, to do the rendering, uh, there's some photorealistic stuff. It'll be in my stampede talk tomorrow morning, um, but uh, where you will see what you think are pictures of a car. They're not, they're just amazing ray tracings of it. Um, so again, we did these big simulations, many, many thousands of compute hours, you know, thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of cores um, to do the simulation. Took some of the cores, grabbed the data still in RAM, um, and did the viz, and managed to get these things integrated, uh, really, in a two or three day workshop. Um, so now we're in sort of the simulation phase of starting to consume and use this data um, for LIGO, and that's all working too. Um, and we've moved on to bigger and better visualizations. I think this is the one they're showing now. Again, I think as Josh mentioned, these don't really happen in a 2D space, which all the visualizations sort of start off showing. So this is sort of in, um, it's called in complex space, but uh, I don't remember exactly the quantities that are plotting here, but you start to see 3D versions where we're trying to make it um, with ray tracing and lighting where it's sort of transparent. You can see into the 3D structure um, and see the things of interest in this space as well. Um, and this is yet another set of folks. You know, now The first set of folks that worked on this were uh, the team that was doing the software-defined viz tools and now sort of our uh, more artistic data visualization folks are collaborating with the theoretical cosmology folks at Cambridge. I hear that's one of the easy majors there. Um, so to produce this next set, of visualization. So um, to me, this is really uh, a fantastic exemplar of how scientific collaborations work. There were many good things that happened here the way that I think it often should, right? Two big teams got together, the Exceed and TAC team with the LIGO team um, with Resolve to make something happen. We got good results. Um, and uh, not only did we get good results, we got the good results using modern hardware in very efficient ways and did performance software. So um, we learned from each other. Um, we got culture changes around software. Um, we were able to take this and apply it to other things like these viz and simulation problems. So we're getting more success out of more teams. I think a big chunk of that is we had theoreticians, experimentalists, computational experts all working together. So world peace can happen. Um, but uh, you know, as sort of equal partners and colleagues, not you know, scientists and service providers or something along those lines. Um, uh, and along the way, you know, there was pretty good science and a Nobel Prize. So um, we do hundreds of collaborations. If I could just get like four a year that work this well, um, that would be pretty good. So four Nobels a year, grant reviews would be so much easier um, <laughs> if we could just make that happen. So. Uh, so I think that's it. So let me just acknowledge all the people who worked on this. Um, 
you know, if the LIGO people hadn't come to the table and stayed persistently with this over years um, to sort of make these changes, this would never have worked. Um, so that was a truly outstanding um, collaboration. We've also had great success, too, with the Cambridge Center for Theoretical Cosmology. Um, uh, the teams that stood up Stampede and Stampede 2 Attack, which is pretty much everybody who works there. So um, my whole center uh, uh, to thank for this. And then the Intel Software Defined Visualization Team, especially Jim Jeffers, who's probably here somewhere. Um, and if I could see anything other than these lights shining in my face, I'd point them out to you. Um, I just assume there's an audience. You could have all left 20 minutes ago. Um, I couldn't tell the difference. Um, but then the folks who did the code optimization um, get mentioned by name here. And then Paul, uh, who was here doing the Viz talk, I think, earlier and running things next door, um, Navratil, the Colorado room, go see it. And his crowd, Ayat, is here. I think she might have given the talk as well or is doing the talk in the Intel booth later. Um, but they did all these visualization talks. Um, this guy, Al Einstein, had a pretty good hypothesis um, that got all this stuff working um, over time. So uh, thanks to all those folks and the people who gave us the money that I probably should mention too. So <laughs> NSF. But anyway, with that, thank you. Thank you.